Does anybody need a Bible? Anybody need a Bible this morning? If you need a Bible, just throw your hand up and we'll grab one for you. If not, that's good. It means you're prepared. I'm rolling up my sleeves because we're digging in to chapter 3 this morning. And chapter 3 is a fun time. Chapter 3 is what they call the seedbed for the entire Bible. Because without chapter 3, most of the rest of the Bible wouldn't make much sense. If we didn't understand why man fell, how man fell, and what happened because of the fall, we wouldn't quite understand everything else that's going on throughout Scripture. And so chapter 3 has so much in it. And we're going to try to get through a bit of it today. Uh, Sadly enough, we aren't going to get through it all, Libby. I'm sorry. But we'll try. We'll get going. All right, so... So as we've been looking in Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth. He created the sun and the moon and the stars. He created the land and the sea and the plants, uh, the fish and the birds. And God created the animals. And then he created man and woman. And we've been discussing that over the last couple of weeks as we've been been looking at the creation story. But here in chapter 3, we're introduced to another character in creation. The serpent, the old dragon the devil or Satan. We don't know much about the devil and his origins, just that he is an angel of the order of the cherubim, and he allowed himself to be puffed up with pride, and he fell. So as we jump in this morning, we're going to discuss a bit and talk about it and take a look at who this character is. So chapter 3, it starts out with, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So we're introduced to this character called the serpent. But he's not just any old serpent because he's more cunning than any of the beasts of the field. We notice that right away that I wouldn't call a serpent, as we know it, a snake, as a beast of the field. You know, when we read through creation, he says that he created the birds and the fish and he created the beasts of the, or he created the cattle and the beasts of the field and creeping things. Well, I think I would put serpent in the creeping thing because as far as I'm concerned, they creep me out. I know some people like snakes, but I'm like, no, they're not, not, they kind of creep me out. So we have this creature here that is a little different, a little special. This was a special serpent because, as we're going to see here, he can talk. He can talk. So that's a little different. I don't know if any of you guys have seen a snake. Do they talk? No. They make kind of freaky noises, but they don't talk. And here he talks. But here's the other thing. Adam and Eve were not freaked out by the fact that this serpent was talking. So when we first read this story, we think, what? Serpent comes up and goes, hey, what's up? Uh, So, did God really say this? And you're like, they didn't go in. What? Who? Why are you talking? They just looked at him and they answered him. As we're going to see as we get deeper into this chapter, at the end of the chapter, part of the curse upon this creature was that um, on his belly he would go and eat dust all the days of his life, indicating to us that this serpent at this point was upright. And then would be down on his belly crawling like we see today, or slithering as we call it. The devil is called the dragon of old in the book of Revelation. It also refers to him as being the beast, being a, a beast of the field. And not of these creeping things that creep along the ground. Many believe that this serpent, this dragon in Genesis was what we would consider a dragon that we read about in stories and, and tales. And sometimes when we realize that, we go, what? Well, look at the T-Rex. If you saw a T-Rex today, you would be a little freaked out. There were creatures, beasts of the field, roaming in those days that we've never seen, except for in museums, that, were, that died off. And here we have this creature that it stands up upright, it speaks, it's a serpent, And many look at it and say, well, you know, this is the dragon of old that we talk about. It's interesting to think about. It's interesting to consider. When you look at all the cultures around the world, they all have a dragon in their history. 
stories and tales of dragons. And it's interesting to think about. Just a side note. We don't know much about the devil and his origins, but we have two places in Scripture that we're going to look at real quickly that give us insight into who he was and what he did. In Ezekiel 28, God is judging the king of Tyre, and he first judges the man. He judges, and then he judges the force behind the man. So when we read this section, we're going to see in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 11, he's speaking to the king of Tyre, but as we read this section, we're going to see he's not necessarily speaking to the king of Tyre. He's speaking to the force behind the king of Tyre. And we're going to see real quick. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. King of Tyre goes, Yeah, I was, wasn't I? (laughs) He's like, I'm not talking about you. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was on your covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the burl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the turquoise, the emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. At this point, we start saying, wait a second, the king of Tyre was never in the Garden of Eden. And the king of Tyre was never arrayed as wonderful as this. This is speaking of a creature of some different than the king of Tyre. It's speaking of the serpent. It's speaking of Lucifer before his fall. It says here that he was arraigned with all of these jewels and emeralds and that the work, workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for, for you on the day you were created. Now, many take this verse and other verses to, to uh, indicate to us that there's a possibility that part of Lucifer's job in heaven before he fell was to lead the angels in worship. His job was to present the music, and he got puffed up. Verse 14, it says, You were the anointed cherub who covers. Now, we've seen those pictures of the Ark of the Covenant with the cherubs with their wings covering. The cherubs are those four angels that we see that are around the throne night and day that are singing, that are worshiping the Lord, that they're there moving around. We see them. And so here it tells us that Lucifer at one point was one of these cherubs. He was there leading the group in worship. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within within you and sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuary by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your, from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become an horror and shall be no more forever. When we see this picture, we see this cherub who had a a high and exalted job in heaven to worship before the throne. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. They were before the throne night and day, worshiping and serving before the throne. But Lucifer puffed himself up with pride. And we're going to see in Isaiah, he puffed himself up and he says, I will, I will, I will. He puffed himself up and he fell. It is important that we understand that although the enemy is cunning and wise, he is still a created being just like us. We have to understand that the enemy is a created being. He is not at the same level as God. The world tries to paint this picture of this battle between these two forces that are equal. No. It's, I, I can't even stretch my arms low, wide enough to show you how far apart they are. The battle, as it were, between Satan and God is not really a battle because God 
could overcome the devil with a simple word. It's not this battle of equal powers. And when we realize that and understand that and we know our place in Christ, we realize that we have power over Satan through Jesus. We have no power through ourselves, but through him and his name, we have power. Because he is a created being and the Lord is in control. Isaiah writes in Isaiah 14, verse 12, this is another section that speaks of Lucifer. It says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mountain of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, Is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms? The devil, Satan, Lucifer, the serpent, the dragon of old, the enemy, was part of God's creation, but he allowed pride in and became puffed up. And he thought he deserved a little more of the praise. Who gets the praise? Who gets the glory? God. The enemy said, I want a bit of that praise for myself. And he fell from his place. He desired some of the glory of God upon himself. And it's important to note that Lucifer knew that he could never be better than God, but he wanted to be like God. And it's interesting because the thing that caused Lucifer to fall is the very thing that caused man to fall because Lucifer sells the same lie over and over again. You can be like God. And man has fallen for it. Over and over and over. Look at all the false religions. Look at all the new age. Look at everything. You can be like God. You have a little God inside of you. You can be like, no, we can't. We can't. We're his children. We can nowhere nowhere come close to being like God. But he has taken his lie and he has thrown it over and over again at people to tempt them and to draw them away from the Lord. So it says here in verse 1, that Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Although the devil is a created being and he has fallen, never forget he is cunning and crafty. He is very cunning and crafty. He is very sneaky. He doesn't storm in, he slithers in. You know, the enemy doesn't come into your life like this. <laughs> I'm going to make you fall into sin. In this fire and lightning and smoke. No. He comes in as an angel of the light coming before you and says, Hey, come with me. You can be like God. Eve was not scared by him. He seemed friendly enough. Which again, when we think of a serpent slithering up to us and talking to us, we think, well, no, I think I would be a little freaked out. Even if I like snakes, I think that a snake coming up and talking to me would be like, okay, you've crossed the line now. This is a little creepy. But that's exactly how the enemy works. Through sly, crafty, subtle ways. He doesn't jump in in front of you with some horrible, gross sin. No, he packages it real nice. He slowly gives you a little bit at a time before you know it. You've been fooled. You've been tricked. The devil loves to wrap up his lies in a bit of truth. He takes a bit of truth and he twists it. He loves to twist things and warp them. Be careful what you're letting into your life. Be careful what you let in. The devil's biggest trick is that he's convinced the world that he doesn't exist. Have you ever noticed that when there's a huge uh, storm and a town is decimated, who do they blame? 
God. They never say the devil did it. They never said the enemy is trying to destroy us. They say it's an act of God. The only time that anyone ever blames the devil is when they get caught and say, the devil made me do it, right? It's about the only time. And they're saying it jokingly, right? But the biggest trick that the enemy ever did was convincing people that he doesn't exist. It's said that Satan attacked the early church with persecution, with wave after wave of persecution. But when he saw that the persecution just served to actually spread the church, he put on a suit and tie and he slithered in and he cuddled up next to us in church on the pew right next to you. He won't start with some gross sin. He knows we're too smart for that. He'll just give you some little distraction to get your eyes off of Jesus. That's how he gets us. You know, the world he's not too worried about because they're already going to hell. But when he comes in and attacks us, he comes in slyly, craftily. And his main goal is to get our view off of Jesus and off of the word of God and onto something else. And in so many times, we can get distracted and thrown off in church where we think we're doing the right thing, but we haven't spent any time with Jesus. We haven't spent any time in the word. And we're running after some new hobby horse, some new thing, some new fad. We go running after it, and then we realize as we continue to run after it, we get distracted. We get our eyes and our hope off of Jesus and onto something else, and soon you find yourself so far from the Lord that you begin to lose your faith because that thing you're running after isn't giving you what they said it was. And then you start saying, well, I guess God doesn't love me, or I guess Jesus doesn't work, and you slowly walk away. And I know a lot of us know people who were in church, who were on fire, who were, were serving the Lord, and they got distracted by something, and they slowly, slowly just left until the point is we talk to them now, and they go, I have no interest. I have no desire to go to church. Jesus let me down. And you go, "How? Jesus didn't let you down. You let yourself down. You fell for the trick of the enemy. You got your eyes off of the Lord. He's an imposter, a fake, and a phony. He loves to disguise his true nature, if necessary, he will parade as an angel of life. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says, And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. He is a great impersonator. He is a counterfeit righteousness apart from the righteousness that comes through faith. He has a false minister, false flocks, false gospel, and false church. He copies everything that the Lord does. He is an imposter and a fake. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 13 says, For such are these false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transformed himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. We see so many in the church today that call themselves Christians, but they don't believe in Christ. You know, there's so many churches today that deny the deity of Jesus Christ. They deny his virgin birth. They deny everything that is the core of what we believe. They die, deny his resurrection. And then they get together and have church. What are they having church for? We talked about it, I think, last week about the atheist churches. Seriously, what, how can you have church if you don't believe anything? You know what it's called? The Rotary Club, the Kinsmen, it's a social group. That's not what it's about. And see, that's how the enemy gets into the church. He doesn't get in and throw a gross sin in your face right away. That might come down the road. But what he does is he slowly moves you away from the Lord until your relationship goes colder and colder, and then he can get his little claws into you. The devil is crafty and cunning. So how can I know the truth? Stick to the word. Stay in the word. Continue to pray. Apply the word to your life and live by it. Actually live by it. Don't just be hearers, but be doers of the word. Eve disobeyed the word because she did not stick to it. She didn't stick to it. 
Let's continue on. He says, And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? This is how the devil works. He always starts by questioning the word of God. Has God really said? Is that what it really said? Is that what he really meant? Is that really what he said? This is the way the enemy gets in. When we look at this and then we look at how the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, we see pretty quickly that the devil really doesn't have any new moves. Because this is exactly what he did to Jesus. He tempted him. And he just slyly was like, well, you know, I know the word says this, but. And that's what the devil does. But how did Jesus overcome the devil? By standing upon the word of God. He stood upon the word of God and he used it against him. He used the word of God against him. He knew it and he lived it and he walked in it. And that's what's so important in our life that we always be taking in the word of God, that we know it. And we... But here's the thing. We can know it, but we have to believe it and live it. We have to apply it to our life. I think one of our biggest problems is that we can cram a bunch up here, but it doesn't get down here. Although they say that we can miss heaven by, what, 18 inches. The distance between our heart and our mind. We can have all the head knowledge, but it never gets to our heart. It'll never change us, but we have to allow it to change us and work. And therefore, when we stand upon it, we go, I know this is true back off. I remember years ago, some Jehovah Witnesses came to the store and they were sharing with me. And I was giving them a rough time like I usually do. And they said, well, how do you know? And I said, I know. How do you know? I said, I know. I know that I know that I know that I know that I know. But how? I said, because I know. And it was making them very angry. Because they were saying, but how? I said, because the word says it and therefore I know. And the Holy Spirit has, you know, shared it to my heart and says that I know. I know that I know. And they were getting mad because they didn't know. And we have to stand upon it and say, I know this is the truth. Whatever lie you're selling me, it's not going to fly. Because I know what the truth is and I'm going to stand my ground. The devil and his followers are always going to question the word of God and try to change the word of God, to edit it into their own twisted ways. And we see that happening so much in our world today where people simply just take sections and say, I don't need that anymore. Or that doesn't apply to me. Or my favorite, that's just your opinion. It's not my opinion, it's what it says. It's not my opinion. This is what it says. I always love that when it's a plain scripture that plainly says, you know, you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that. And they say, well, that's just your opinion or that's just what you read into it. I didn't read anything into it. This is what it says. We need to stand upon the word. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the tr fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Eve answered, answered the devil's question, but in her answer, she added to what God had said. God said, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day you eat, it, eat of it you shall surely die. Eve added, nor shall you touch it, and she subtracted, you can freely eat. She subtracted some from the scriptures and she added some to the scriptures. The devil's question was designed to place doubt in the mind of Eve to make her wonder, is God holding out on me? Is God really holding out on me? Is there something more that he's got hidden? What did God really say? It's designed to place that doubt, to place that, that frustration. Does God really love me? Or does he just love those people? He places the doubt in our mind. Eve subtracted the freely eat, which speaks of God's provision and love. And she added to his command, he could command, you shall not touch it. She added it to it. Also, she changed surely die, an actual statement. You shall surely die to lest you die, which speaks of a possibility. 
She changed it from you shall surely die to yeah, you might possibly die. It's a dangerous offense to change the word of God and we have to be careful because so often people want to change the word of God. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Satan plants doubt in her heart with a question and then outright denies the word of God. Notice here that the enemy knows what God said. She said, lest you die, he says, you will not surely die. He out and out disobeys and throws the scripture in the face and says, nah, God's lying. God's lying. Satan plants doubt in our heart and then just out and out denies the word of God. I know that's what it says, but it's not true. I don't know how many times I've shared with someone a section of Scripture and they answer with, but. They answer with, but. And I never understand that. You're sharing them. They, they say, hey, I've got this issue. And you say, well, this is what the Scripture says. And they go, yeah, but in my life it doesn't fit. It's like, no, it fits in everybody's life. I remember John Corson once sharing, and he said he had a couple in, and he was doing marriage counseling, and he was going, they were telling them the issues that they were having, and so he opened the word, and he read a section, and the husband and wife both said, yeah, but that doesn't really apply, and so he ripped the pages out of his Bible and threw them on the floor, and this couple both jumped up and were like screaming at him, how dare you rip the pages out of the Bible, what is wrong, and he said, you just did it by saying, yeah, this doesn't apply to us. Like, it applies to all of us. By saying, yeah, but, you're just ripping the pages out. You're saying, oh, it doesn't apply to me. Satan here says, yeah, I know that's what he said, but it's not true. It's not true. We have to understand Satan is a liar and the father of lies. This is what he does for a living. John 8, 44, it says, you are, the, you, you are of your father, the devil, and the de- and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He murdered Adam and Eve. Think of it that way. He killed Adam and Eve by leading them into sin, by deceiving them. He says, you were a murderer from the beginning and does, not, and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. God is the God of truth. Eve should have reminded herself of that and turned away and walked away. Here's the thing. The devil shouldn't have gotten past his first comment without Eve walking away and saying, this doesn't sound right. It's when we linger around temptation that we fall. It's when we stay around, well, give me a little bit more. Let's see where this is going, that we tend to fall. When temptation comes a knock and we must go fleeing, we must run. Especially when we know that it contradicts the word of God. If someone comes to us and shares, hey, I've got this new truth. You don't have to live righteously anymore. You don't have to live for the Lord. You just do this. You go, no, I'm sorry. That's not what the word of God says. I'm going the other way. I'm running away. God's truth is our shield, but it does us no good unless we pick it up by faith and use it. We can have memorized the word of God. We can have our Bible with us all the time and be doing devotions every day, but if we don't pick it up and use it, it's of no use to us. You know, when we see a prominent Christian leader fall, we often think, how? It's because they put down the Word of God and they allowed themselves to grow cold and be drawn away into temptation. I remember when one pastor, he, he fell into sin and, and uh, the one pastor said, hey, is there anything you want me to share with the other people? And he said, it wasn't worth it. It's not worth it. It's 
It's not worth it to allow the devil to linger and allow his temptations to linger and draw you into sin. Verse 5, he continues, he says, For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan throws in the very lie that caused him to fall. You will be like God. Satan puffed himself up with pride and said, I want the glory and the honor and the praise of God, but I want it upon me. And he fell. Someone asked once, why would Satan spend all his time trying to destroy mankind's relationship with God? Why would Satan spends so much time trying to destroy mankind's relationship with God when he knows that his number is up. Why would he care? And the best illustration I've ever heard is he's like that guy at the pool party who's been pushed into the pool. You know what it's like, guys. You're walking next to the pool, or gals, you might have done this. I, usually it's the guys who are a little bit more meaner this way. But you're walking next to the pool, and some friends walk up and they push you in. And you're fully clothed, cell phone in pocket, you know, your wallet's in your pocket, and you're like, no! What do you do? Your hands instantly go out, and you grab anyone you can and pull them in with you. Well, that's what the enemy's doing. He's just going, I know I'm done, and I'm going to grab as many as I can and drag them down with you, because you know what? He doesn't care about you. The other trick that the devil has created is that he has some kingdom somewhere, and he rules it. When his number's up, he's going to be a prisoner just like everyone else. He's not going to have some special position. He doesn't rule hell. Hell is his hell. Yeah, so we have to understand that. When people say, oh, yeah, I'm going to go party in hell with my friends, like, no, you're not, because there ain't no party, and there's nobody in charge but God. And he desires more than anything that no man or woman ever go there. Because it wasn't created for them. It was created for the devil and his demons. He doesn't care about you. He just wants to hurt God. Anyone who has rejected God's truth and his love, when you get right down to it, has fallen for this lie. This lie that they can be like God. They want all the glory upon themselves. Look what we did. Despite the fact, as we've been going through this book, despite the fact that the world says we all came from a pile of goo, we're all accidental happenstance, they also want to say, well, look what we did. Look what the mistake did. Let's get all the glory for what we did. It's like, you didn't do anything. You just admitted you're an accident. Everything you do in your life is a mistake. That's what you're saying. And yet you want to take all the glory for it. What is the lie that man has fallen for? You can be your own God and live for, live for creation rather than the creator. And you can do it all without any consequences. That's the lie. And it should not be believed. And they never realize that they've fallen into the Satan's diabolical plan to destroy mankind. And that their destiny is to follow the devil and his angels into the lake of fire. Not into some cosmic party. Have you ever wondered how someone goes from loving God and being active in the church to backsliding into a life of sin and denial of God and his truth? It all starts with a seed of doubt planted in their hearts. Did God actually say? Does God actually love you? Does he actually care? Then we begin to question God's word. Soon we will deny his word. And then we're open to believe the enemy's lies. So how do we stand against the enemy? We look to Jesus. He stood upon the word of God. He stood upon the word of God and he shut the enemy's mouth. The enemy had no power. The enemy had nothing. If we stand upon the word of God, we can stand in his truth. And the enemy has no choice but to back off. Verse 6, it says, So when the, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, 
and that it was pleasant to the eye and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. Never think that your temptation is unique. You know, I think that's one of the other lies that we fall for. This thing I'm struggling for, no one will understand because no one has ever dealt with this before. Our temptations are not new, unique to us. They may be in a different area or a different way, but they're all the same temptation. If you want to see the pattern for sin, look up 1 John 2, verse 16. 1 John 2, verse 16, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that, in the, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Eve looked upon the fruit and saw that it was good for food the lust of the flesh. She, thought, she saw that it was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eyes. And she saw that it was desirable to make one wise, the pride of life. Whenever a temptation comes, we must check ourselves on these things. Is it the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life? All sin falls into one or all of these areas when we allow ourselves to be dragged into sin. She took of its fruit and she ate it. She also gave it to her husband with her, and he ate it. She ate it, but sadder still, Adam ate it as well. Adam should have stood up and said, wait a second. What's going on? When we look at this, it's interesting because I remember being as a kid and learning this story, and it said that Eve ate of it, and I was always taught that Eve ate the fruit, and then she went and found Adam. Adam, Adam, where are you? And she brought Adam the fruit, and he ate it. But what does it say here? Look what it says here. It says, she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. He was there. He was standing right there. He heard the conversation. Adam stood quietly there and listened. He didn't step in. He didn't try to stop Eve, Eve or correct the serpent. He just stood there. Eve was deceived, but Adam sinned with his eyes wide open. Adam knew what he was doing. Adam just accepted it and took the fruit. 1 Timothy 2.14 says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and fell into transgressions. Adam was not deceived. He willfully disobeyed God. And that's why the fall of man falls on Adam and not Eve. That's why throughout Scripture it says that it was because of Adam's sin. And I remember it being young too, thinking, well, but Eve was the first one to eat. Why is she getting away with it? Why? Because Adam, as we learned last week, Adam was supposed to be the head. He was supposed to be the one watching out for her. He was supposed to be the one who said, what are you doing? Stop. Don't go there. Don't eat that fruit. What are you doing? Remember what the word says. We need to stand on it. Eve was deceived by the enemy while Adam walked right into sin, eyes wide open, open. As we looked last week, God created Eve out of the side of Adam. God gave Eve to Adam. They were made whole again as they came together in marriage, but they both had different duties and different roles. Adam was to protect and watch over her. Woman was designed for a desire for relationship and spirituality. Women were designed for a desire for relationship and spirituality. They were wired differently than men, which is a good thing. Because as we talked about last week, we actually push each other and pull each other in different directions. We, like I said, Shauna will actually get me to be a little bit more emotional, but she draws the emotion out of me that is, you know, stunted because I'm a guy. And on the other side, I actually will slow her down when her emotions are running away. Because I'll just say, no. And then she cries for a bit. We'll have to edit this. <laughs> but it's true, right? We balance each other out. We slow each other down. We keep each other in pace. Adam's job was to protect the woman and take care of her. 
But because of the desire for relationship and spirituality, women are more likely to get deceived, more open to be deceived because they want and they desire whatever it is. They want to grow closer. And so Eve looked at it and said, oh, I want to be close to God. To be like with him would be closer. And so she just fell into it. And that's where man comes in. Man, men, we're a little slower when it comes to emotions and spirituality. That's why when we have a prayer meeting or a Bible study, often there'll be usually more women than men. If you have a special church night, there usually were more women than men because women will go rushing for that, that time and men are kind of like, well, I'll be there. Hold on, here I come. Maybe next week. I'm on my way. We're a little slower getting there. But because we're slower moving in our emotions and relationship and spirituality, we are to lead our wives. We're to pull back on the reins a little bit and we consider things a little bit more. And so therefore we complement each other. But here Adam fell short of his duties. Adam fell short of his duties. He should have jumped in and said, Eve, what are you doing? First of all, what are you doing by that tree? And second of all, what are you doing talking to a snake? What are you, nuts? He should have been there saying, wait a second. I love you, honey, but we're not going to eat that because God said we shouldn't. And God said we will die. Don't listen to him. Let's stand upon the word of God. But you know what? Adam wasn't listening to the Lord either. We as men are to wash our wives in the word. In Ephesians 5, 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Husbands, it's our job to wash our wives with the word of God to continually share the Word of God with them, to read it with them, to spend time with them. Now, wives, this doesn't mean that you can turn around and say, well, see, what this says here is that uh, if I'm a mess, it's your fault. You probably shouldn't do that because it'll probably cause a fight. You know, just throwing that out there. I don't want any phone calls afterwards. Thanks a lot. The drive home was great. We are to be complimenting each other and working together. Adam was created perfect, the first man of all creation. No genetic problems, no hang-ups, no mummy or daddy issues. He was perfect, but he walked into disobedience. Now, some teach that Adam did this because he saw that his wife had fallen and he felt sorry for her and he didn't want to be separated from her, so he ate as well. Well, you know what? The scriptures don't tell us that. The scriptures tell us that Adam walked disobediently into sin. Had nothing to do with his wife. He just took of the fruit and ate. He simply walked into sin. They call this chapter, like I said before, the seedbed for the entire Bible because the fall of man begins the work of God's plan of redemption. Without chapter 3, the rest of the Bible doesn't make much sense. We must understand that through Adam, the first man, all mankind fell. Through Adam's sin, all mankind fell into sin. We were plunged into sin through Adam. We were infected with sin. And the only cure was the love of God demonstrated when he sent his son to die upon the cross for us. And Paul calls Jesus the second Adam because Jesus was born perfect, just like Adam. And Jesus lived sinless, not like Adam. And Jesus laid his life down. And he died that we could be born again. Born again. That we could be born again spiritually. And come back to life. That our relationship with the Lord could be reunited. None of us can be righteous on our own. We need his righteousness applied to our life through faith in him. Through Jesus' sacrificial death upon the cross, it cures us. It cures us from the, the plight, from the disease of sin.
They died spiritually the moment that they bit into that fruit. They died spiritually. See, the devil implied to them, he just said they were going to die. He said, you will not surely die. What he didn't tell them is that by, un- by eating that fruit, by disobeying God, you are going to die spiritually, which is way worse than dying physically. You can kind of imagine after they bit into the fruit, it doesn't say that the serpent said anything else, but you can imagine going, <laughs> gotcha. He fell for my lie. Gotcha. Verse 7, it says, Then the eyes of both them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Their eyes were opened and they were ashamed of their nakedness. Why? Because sin brings shame. Sin kills innocence kills it. It destroys it. But the sadder thing here was that they hid from God. They hid from God. Their relationship with God had been severed. You can imagine that God most likely came and he walked each day with them in the cool of the day. I always love this section because it's so beautiful. Can you imagine walking with God the Father? What's that? How did you do that? Why'd you make that? What's that up there? It's just like having a little kid when they just learn how to talk, right? What about that? What about this? You can imagine, Adam. How did this work? How does that work? How does this? What is that thing? You know, he's just been blown away. But that relationship here is severed. That relationship here is severed as they begin to hide from the Father. It's broken. They were broken. Adam and Eve were created perfect. But here we see them sewing fig leaves together. They're sewing fig leaves. Now, all of the illustrations and pictures, they show them just wearing a little tiny, you know, loincloth or whatever, right? Or just one leaf. Well, mistakenly, it says they sewed them together. Now, when they find these leaves from back five, 6,000 years ago, these tropical plants, they find these plants that are like huge Their leaves are massive compared to what they are today. So when they sewed fig leaves together, they probably made themselves like a full suit. You know, sewed it all together real nice. Which is pretty inventive. Except they picked fig leaves. Which are, have a nice fuzz on them that are very itchy and and uncomfortable. Make you all scratchy. They picked like the worst leaf you could pick to put on a naked body. But they sewed these fig leaves together in a hurry to cover themselves up. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Depending on your understanding of who the Father is, you may read this differently. Some see God as a big meanie in the clouds, and so they would think this was a, where are you? I don't see you. I'm coming to get you. But those of us who spent time with the Lord spend time learning about the Lord, have opened the word of God, we would see this as a father who is brokenhearted. A father who often would come. It's kind of like coming into the backyard and the kids aren't there. And you know right away they're hiding because they've done something. But you're not mad at them, you're sad because they're hiding from you. Now how many fathers have experienced that when your kids hid from you? I, for me personally, the first time they did it, it, it actually saddened me because I knew that they had done something they shouldn't have done and that they were scared of me. And they shouldn't have been scared of me because they'd, they'd never, every time, other time I came to the backyard, it was like, Daddy, come jump on the trampoline. Daddy, come play. Daddy. And this time it's, what, where are they? I heard them and now they're gone because I came out on the back deck. What did you do? But the voice of God here, when we look at it, I believe, is 
Oh, guys, where are you? What have you done? You can almost hear the tears of the father. Where are you guys? Adam, Eve, where are you? At this day, they hid something. They hid from him. They did something differently. They hid from the Lord. Every other day, they probably ran to him. Ran to him with smiles on their faces. The Lord's here. But this day, they hid. The devil told them that they could have the knowledge of good and evil. And as they sinned, they lost their innocence, their childlike faith. It was not necessary for them to ever have this knowledge. They could have lived their lives growing to know the Lord in a state of complete innocence. But they fell. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Sin brings shame and guilt which causes us to want to hide. Look what sin does to a perfect couple. This was the perfect couple. Like I said, there was no hang-ups. There's no, they can't complain, they can't blame it on their parents. There was no issues. This was the perfect couple. And now they're hiding behind a tree from God. I'm sh- that just shows us how much they've fallen already. Where they think they can hide in some trees from God who created everything. Sin brings shame and destruction. I've got a news flash for you people. You can't hide from God. There are those that are constantly trying to hide from God. The world tries to hide from God. That is why nightclubs and bars and things are always in the dark. They think, well, if it's dark, I can hide. He won't know. Well, you know what? He's there. He's everywhere. He knows exactly what you're doing. He knows exactly where you are. That's why when it says here, where, when it says that the Lord God said, where are you? He wasn't surprised. He wasn't angry. He was sad. Oh, guys, where are you? Why are you hiding from me? And Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid. Well, you know what's cool? Here as Adam and Eve have fallen, they're ashamed. They've sewn fig leaf costumes and put them on. They're hiding from the Lord. They're scared and afraid. But who comes looking for them? God the Father. He comes looking for them. He comes to find them. Jesus came with the same mission. It says in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. God is coming into the garden saying, where are you guys? We got to fix this problem, guys. We got to begin this work, this plan of redemption to make things right. He will forgive you and save you. He will come into your life and comfort and guide you. There is so much more to go through in this chapter. This chapter is a big chapter. There's lots to go through. We're going to wrap it up right here because I think it's so important that we wrap it up. And understand that God is seeking you. He's not mad at you. He's not angry at you. He's seeking you. He's a loving father saying, where are you? Why are you hiding? Where are you? He loves us so much. He's seeking those which were lost. When Adam and Eve fell, their relationship was severed. Their relationship was severed. There was something different that took place. They didn't have the same conversations. They didn't have the same relationship. They were severed. And as we're going to see next week, they're going to be booted out of the garden that God created for them. They're going to have to start living by the sweat of their brow. Their relationship has been severed. 
And they no longer can spend time with the Lord in the cool of the day. But the Lord's plan is, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to make it right. And we're going to be together again. That's the Lord's plan and his desire. Is that you would come to him and say, Father, forgive me. Forgive me of of my sins. Wash me clean with your blood. Make me new. That I can be your child again. That I can walk with you in the cool of the day. So how do we protect ourselves from the enemy's lies? Stick in the word. Spend time with the Lord in the cool of the day. Now, whatever time that cool of the day is, some people it's early in the morning, sometimes it's the afternoon, sometimes mid-morning, sometimes mid-afternoon, sometimes, I could go on forever, uh, in the evening, wherever it is that time of that day where you can get away and spend time with the Lord, spend time with Him, spend time in His Word. Say, Father, show me. Think of yourself like Adam and Eve. Say, hey, Lord, what's that? What's this? Show me this. I need to understand this more. Help me to be strengthened in this. And he'll work in your life and he'll protect you from the lies of the enemy that he just wants to rip you off. And we can call out to him and draw close to him. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you give us so much. And Lord, help us to understand, Lord God. Help us to understand that you're seeking us, that you're not angry that you're not yelling, where are you? But you're saying, where are you? Where did you go? Why are you hiding? Come here, let me make things right. Let me heal you. Let me restore you. Let me refresh you. And Lord, for those that are hiding, those that are running away, Lord God, I pray that you would draw them back. That they would see your love and your peace, Lord God. And that you would touch them, Lord, in a special way and be working in their lives and in their hearts, Lord God. And I pray that this week we would just come to know you better, that we would spend more time with you and just grow in you and just see your love and your plan of redemption as your plan from the very beginning was that I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to bring you back into relationship. I'm going to wash you clean. I'm going to restore you and renew you and bring you back to life. Lord, we thank you so much for your truth. We thank you so much for your word. I ask that you would continue to move in our lives, continue to work in our hearts. In Jesus' precious name, amen.